what can seem like an innocuous term, indirect land use, is stirring up a major environmental controversy. The crux of the issue here, does growing more corn for ethanol here in the U.S. lead to more destruction of rainforests in South America? The ethanol industry is now concerned the EPA has included that factor, indirect land use, in a proposed rule evaluating the emissions of biofuels. Clean Sky's Dan Goldstein continues his report on the ethanol industry. Could planting this lead to this? That's at the heart of the so-called indirect land use debate. It's the theory that as U.S. farmers grow more crops for biofuels like corn-based ethanol, they plant less soybeans. And as surging economies like China need those soybeans, they have to get them from somewhere else. And that somewhere else is Brazil, the second largest soybean grower behind the U.S. And to plant those beans, so the theory goes, it has to destroy rainforest, thus increasing greenhouse gas emissions. What's happened with ethanol is we expanded the demand. We created corn-based ethanol. Uh, in order to prop up corn prices and, of course, boost the prospects of the ethanol industry. When we did that, we had the same effect in other countries as taking crops, uh, land off the market here. It gave them an incentive to expand and grow the very crops that we were diverting for use here in ethanol. So it may be difficult to quantify, we understand that, but the phenomenon is very clear. If you look at the theory versus the facts, the facts don't agree with the theory. General Wesley Clark, who now heads the ethanol trade group Growth Energy, says that as ethanol production in the U.S. was ramping up under the renewable fuel standard, rainforest destruction in Brazil was actually falling. In 2004, 10,500 square miles of the Amazon was deforested. And in 2008, that number dropped again to less than 5,000 square miles, according to the National Institute for Space Research. There's actually less land devoted to growing corn today than there was in the 1930s. So there's no new cropland taking place. Instead, what it is is more production of corn, more productivity per acre of land. Not through more fertilizer, but through better techniques and better technology in the seeds. So when you then come up, up and say, what about indirect land? It's a great academic theory, but it's only a theory. Now, theory or not, indirect land use effects have already become a hot topic here in Washington, especially for lawmakers from corn states like Iowa and Minnesota. They've urged the EPA to actually not include such a land use effects in their landmark ruling coming up later this year on biofuels emissions. Now the California Air Resources Board, however, has included such a standard in their ruling. And that means that if the EPA adopts the same approach, it could mean nearly $3 billion in tax breaks for the ethanol industry could be in jeopardy. This bill contains numerous flaws. The California decision alarmed many farm state Democrats. One of them was House Agriculture Committee Chairman Colin Peterson. He, along with 27 other House Democrats, vowed not to vote for the Waxman-Markey bill unless the EPA promised not to include effects language in its proposed bioemissions rule. And while farm states got their way this time, the issue isn't going away anytime soon. We think indirect land use is a reality, that this is a problem. It's difficult to quantify, but we've been struggling with this for decades in agricultural policy. So far, despite the ramp up in ethanol production, U.S. exports of corn and soybeans have held up, with soybean exports hitting a record in 2008. But as California goes, so often does the nation. So expect to hear more debate on indirect land use in Washington this harvest season. For Clean Skies News, I'm Dan Goldstein.